just out of curiosity, have any of you before hearing about this event tonight heard of Samuel Franklin Cody? Good. Uh, I had I, I sort of tripped over him, I don't even know how many years ago. Uh, I was fascinated for quite some time with giant kites, man looking kites that were sort of the, the predecessors of power aviation as we know it. And once I got hold of his name, I started to see it popping up all over the place throughout our library and research center. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how prominent a character he really was in aviation. But uh, there were a couple of biographies that sort of defined what the world knew about Samuel Cody prior to 1999. And unfortunately, he was not only a self-made man, he was a self-invented man, uh, as we found out. There were sort of two lives that I had to learn about and, and reconcile these two lives with one another. The first two biographies of him were first and second hand accounts. These were people who knew Cody or knew his family after his death. And he had invented this persona that was really larger than life. And once I found out the truth, that's exactly what it was. And something seems to be true. And frequently it is. Uh, and unfortunately, a little bit of his persona was exactly that. However, that his accomplishments in flight have never been disparaged and have been tremendously well documented. And uh, it, it really started even before his interest in kites. Uh, he, and the character that he was portrayed as in the early part of his life, Samuel Cody, uh, he was born to Samuel Sr. and his, his mother, Eugene Burnett, Texas, in 1861. And they lived on a quaint ranch with a vineyard. And Cody's father went in the Civil War and he returned a little bit worse for the wear, but he was a decorated officer in this version of Cody's life. And uh, Sam Cody, the junior, was introduced to kites when his father returned from the war at the age of three. And he grew up on the ranch learning to ride horses and shoot guns. Uh, and as he progressed up through the ranch uh, business, he became the, uh, what did they, they called him, the horse ram, who was in charge of all the saddle horses. And when he was a teenager, he was in, one of my favorite stories, he was in the boathouse late one night. And because they lived on the edge of civilization in Texas, they were under constant fear of Indian raids. And the story that was perpetuated was that Cody heard a ruckus outside the, the bunkhouse and went out to investigate. He was shot in the leg by an Indian raiding party. The ranch was burned to the ground. He crawled eight miles through the brush, crossed a river to get to Fort Worth, where, his, where he was tended to medically. Returned to the site, no sign of his family whatsoever. Uh, he thought his family had left him, so he took a cat trail and led some what turned out to be absolutely true, but almost unbelievable cattle uh, trails, leading in excess of 1,500 head over 1,300 miles, losing only about 75 or about 75 head of cattle one horse and one, one ranch hand, which at the time was really unheard of. Uh, unfortunately, in the late 90s, a large collection of Samuel Cody's personal memorabilia and ephemera notes, letters, books, uh, came up for auction at Sullivan's, and what the world thought we knew about Sam Cody was absolutely destroyed. Uh, he was born not Samuel Franklin Cody, but Franklin Samuel Cowdery, his dad, he was enlisted in the Civil War. He was a very early enlistment. He was captured twice, sort of snuck his way out of military prison by claiming some medical illness. He was captured again within a few weeks. Came back an absolutely broken man. Uh, the story that we thought we knew about Cody was really, as I said, he was a self-invented, not just a self-made man. Uh, however, as I said, all of these, which, which led to my fascination with this character, this, this paradox that he had created. Uh, nothing that he accomplished had ever really been disputed. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this persona in a moment. He did grow up riding cattle trails. He, did, he was a, an expert horseman, an expert marksman, and shot. Uh, in fact, he joined in 1888 the Adam Warpaw and Sells Brothers Circus. A big competitor to Ringling Brothers, or, uh, I'm sorry, not Ringling Brothers, but uh, the uh, yeah, Barnum's and Barnum and Bailey Circus. The Wild West show featured trick riding, shooting. Uh, Doc Carver was one of the acts. He once worked with uh, a young woman who would become known as Annie Oakley while he was running in the circus uh, for 
the show coincided with a character that we may be a little bit more familiar with. Do you recognize him? Which pony is that? <laughs> it's Buffalo Bill Cody. His Bob West show was sweeping the world. It was all over Europe uh, at the time. His name was well made in the United States. And uh, when, when Adam Forpaugh died, his, his circus sort of disbanded, and Cody was left to, to make his own way in the world. And this character is Sam Cody, who's very reminiscent to Buffalo Bill Cody. In fact, Sam and his wife at the time tried to pass themselves off as uh, Captain Cody and Miss Cody, Buffalo Bill's son and daughter. <laughs> that is, until Buffalo Bill's legal team, they had such a thing in, in the 1890s, caught wind of the fact that Cody was trying to pass himself off as a, a relative and in any way affiliated with Buffalo Bill. And the show was really quickly cut down. So there was a lot, there was threats of law, lawsuits. Uh, Cody, Samuel Cody backed away from it because he just didn't have the means to, to pursue this facade. Uh, and it was shortly after this that he met his second wife, according to his, uh, his prior biography, who had four children. We find out that three of the four children were hers. Um, one of them was sort of relegated to nephew status, which was kind of interesting because I think the chronology of their meeting in the child's age just didn't finish. So they made him a nephew. Um, and um, had one child of their own. This is Leela Davis, uh, who was not his wife, was his common law wife. They just uh, fell in love and, and took up with one another, as they would say. Uh, they went on to form the Cody family traveling show. And we see up at the top of the banner is Sam himself and then the three of the children and Leela over the side. And I'm going to step around the podium. I don't know if you can read this, but uh, the, this, this show is announcing that if there's any lady or gentleman in the audience uh, during Mr. Cody's shooting act who would care to undergo the sensation of having a glass ball shot from his or her own head, Mr. Cody will oblige them with the greatest pleasure. <laughs> this is Leela. His, his common law wife, these are glass globes that they balanced and then attached to her. There's one little inaccuracy here, the blue leggings. Uh, I read that she constantly wore red leggings. Can you guess why? <laughs> it was a good shot. <laughs> Maybe not a great shot. Probably part of the myth of Cody that he built for himself, but she wore the red leggings. Her children were involved in the show, and they didn't want to terrify the audience at the point slightly astray and grazed her leg. So she wore red leggings, being that way. Um, these are the kids, and unfortunately the laser pointer just gets soaked up in the screen here, so I can't really use it. But uh, the kids did some really fantastic trick shooting, and my favorite image is, is on a, a different poster that didn't really reproduce. But we start to get an indication of some of the shooting that was done. One of the kids was, from the, the illustration, looks like he was about eight or 10 years old, and Cody would grab him by the elbows and swing him back and forth. And the boy would shoot his pistols at the targets on the other side of the, the hall. Um, they really, really performed well with this. Uh, they traveled to England. They held court in uh, the Alexandra and the Crystal Palace for years, selling out both venues. In fact, at one point, the youngest of the, the children who participated in the show was actually picked, doing double duty between venues. Uh, it, perform the first act with the Cody family in one venue, and then run across town to perform his own shooting act on another side, and then come back to the final act of, of the Cody event. Um, they were really a, a, an interesting family, and they did some amazing things. And after performing and, and selling out uh, their shows, they, they kind of fell on some hard times. They went to Monte Carlo before. Unfortunately, there were some other activities that happened in Monte Carlo that lost the family of fortune that had been so rapidly gained. Um, and the family fell on hard times, and Cody came up with this scheme that we see here, that uh, he figured that even the fastest bicycle rider in the world could not beat him and a team of horses in a long distance race. And, and when I say long distance, these were three day long races. It was an aggregate distance over time. And in the, in the first event, it was, of course, it was a real nail biter right down to the last minute. Um, and Cody pulled out a fantastic win. Uh, the prize was 10,000 francs. 
and thousands of spectators gathered to watch as he, he won by a mere 12 kilometers, which is a good distance when you think about the three-day aggregate component to this. Uh, it becomes a little bit more dramatic. They took this show all over England and Europe as well, challenging the best cyclists the continent had to offer. Um, greater and greater theatrics were involved. There were incidents where Cody would be thrown from his horse and carried off to the sidelines as the cyclist kept rounding the track. And Cody would rise from his sick bed, climb onto a track horse, and make a spectacular finish. Uh, of course, always beating the cyclist. It's kind of like a hard road drive today. <laughs> And at the very end of, of this shtick, Cody even took to not only running chariots, but riding two horses, one foot on each saddle around the, around the track. Uh, he was, if nothing else, he was a great showman. Uh, and that really, really paid off later in his career. Uh, because he could turn those, those showman tricks to, to get great advantage. Um, while traveling in Europe, we really start to see Cody's inventive genius, and unfortunately I haven't been able to find any images of this. But he was reported at the very end of the 19th century to have developed what was described as a rapid fire in handgun. You could fire 16 shots within three fifths of a second. Uh, tremendous accomplishment at the time. And Cody was, was very secretive. He, was, he wasn't terribly well educated at him, uh, growing up on the cattle trail. But he was very street smart. He knew that he didn't want to put all of his tooling and all of his machining into one shop. He parted the gun out into three different venues. Uh, one of them did the breech and the barrel. Another, let me see, another produced a barrel and breech. Uh, the moving mechanisms were done in the second shop, and he took on the third component of this by himself, assembled the pieces together and uh, offered it to the British War Office. As brilliant an inventor as Cody was, and we'll see evidence of his lack of business acumen a little bit later, uh, his, his initial volley to the British War Office in around 1899 was 1,000 pounds on delivery of the gun, an additional 4,000 pounds plus a royalty on each gun produced following that. The War Office, not recognized, not having a recognizable name, uh, just pooh-poohed the whole ordeal and sent Cody on his way. Uh, remember, he's not going to learn from this lesson. This, this was just an outrageous expectation uh, for, for an untried, untested, and unproven adventure. So one of his, his sidelines that is corroborated in both of those biographies that I talked about is for a short time in the eight, late 1800s, he went to the Klondike as part of one of the big gold rushes. He returned uh, terribly disappointed, but he turned that to his advantage when he wrote the musical, theatrical Klondike Nugget. Uh, yeah, which again, the whole family was involved in this. This is actually uh, Vivian. He's the nephew. He's the, the oldest of the group. They dressed him up as, as an Indian. Uh, he, was, he was part of the, the stage show. Um, it was a three-act melodrama titled The Klondike Nugget. It was performed at, as I mentioned, the Alexander Palace. And this is just to give you an idea of the scope of the venues that Cody and his family at the show were packing uh, night after night. Uh, for a number of years, they performed here. Uh, his original experience with mining, as I said, was really less than satisfactory. Uh, but he turned it to his good fortune. Featured very elaborate sets. This is an actual photo of one of the stage sets. Uh, there were Indian war parties, an exploding bridge, a diving horse, uh, knife fights. They performed several shows every week. Uh, after they left the Alexander Palace, they went on to the Crystal Palace. So a, a bit of his background that, that is, is a very uh, multi-talented person. In 1899, he became fascinated with kites, and this is one of my favorite pictures. This, uh, he was a big guy. He was over six feet tall. Um, descriptions, I'm not great with, with the conversion of English weights to American. It even gets worse when you start talking with stones. He weighed somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 stones. The stone was somewhere around 12 or 14 pounds. So he was, he was a substantial guy. Uh, so naturally, the kites he owns, were, were very large as well. This thing I've, I've estimated, it's got to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or even 24 feet. If you figure him 
six feet tall and used to travel in. Uh, and this is one of his early kite designs. Um, dressed, as always, as Wild West regalia as he took these box kites out. Um, and he'd take the kids out into the, the fields up in front of the Alexander Palace and spend hours assembling these kites and setting them up. Uh, the onlookers and the bystanders absolutely loved it. Uh, then he started looking at man lifting devices. Now, instead of just building bigger and bigger kites, which is what a lot of inventors were doing at the time, uh, it's what even when the Wright brothers were little boys, they had a flying toy that their father gave them when they were about 7 or 11 years old. It was a little rubber band powered propeller that covered, it was like a helicopter that would cover up and then the rubber band would climb down and it would drop. And they figured, whoops, there's those. Um, they figured that they'd just build this bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until they could climb into one and they'd be able to fly away. But what they didn't count on was that law of cues. If you double the size of something, the weight of it travels. Uh, so you get to a certain size limit that it just outweighs its own ability to fly. So Cody understood this and he sent this train of kites, these first four that we see, all they're doing is lifting a cable. It's this final kite that carries a basket and the pilot is actually an active pilot in this role. And I'll call them back and forth here. These cables that are coming off go to the front and back edges of the kite so the pilot can adjust the attitude, the angle of attack of the kite when he tips the kite up he'll ride up on this pulley that rides that main cable and he can lower himself or there's even a brake on the pulley uh, that would arrest it when he got to the altitude that he wanted. So he was experimenting with this and, and some of these kites, this is, this is my very favorite picture, this is the workshop at the Alexander Palace. Some of these kites were up to 36 feet in wingspan and if you can't quite make it out, here's Cody in the middle here and this from edge to edge of the screen almost, is one of his largest kites. Um, at the turn of the century, the military, he's still pursuing the military, uh, utilized balloons for observation. But if any of you have had any experience with hot air balloons on a windy day, they're almost useless. And the military recognized that, but that was their best technology to get above the enemy troops um, in order to, to see what was going on. So Cody, recognizing that fact, was developing these as a military observation tool. Uh, and so he started marketing this to the balloon factory, part of the, the, what would become the Royal Aircraft Factory, the British War Office. And the, the Army, after his, his previous deal with them, really wasn't that keen on the Cody Day or his developments. And things moved very slowly, so he threw his hat into another ring with the Navy. And here he is flying off the deck of a ship um, in the foreground, and then in the background you can see another ship. Uh, and, and this was Cody's way of sort of giving the, the Army a nudge in the ribs to get things moving. And the Navy seemed very interested in these, and, and you can see here he's hovering over Spithead near Hampshire. And anytime we see an observation from on high like this, we, we start to think of uh, the vulnerability. Once the enemy gets over the same technology, be they balloons, dirigibles, or later heavier than aircraft, we start to realize just how vulnerable we are from the air. Uh, so the military, obviously, once they're shown a picture like this, start to realize that there's might be something to this flying or the uh, They may want to get themselves in on the game that Cody was trying to play. His first real practical use, though, of, of a kite, and this doesn't look terribly practical in today's uses, but uh, he has a 12-foot kite, with a, uh, sorry, a 12-foot boat. It's canvas and wooden structure. It's a collapsible hull with a 15-foot kite. And he decided in 1903, he was going to use this to sail across the English Channel. Uh, a full six years before Louis Blair was going to do it in a, a heavier than aircraft, and we start at the bottom of the screen here. He figured this crossing would take him about an hour, let me see here, because bear with me. Uh, 40, yeah, a 45 minute crossing is what he thought he was going to be able to accomplish with this kite. What he didn't count on was right about here, the wind gave out, and the currents picked up. 
and he had the reel in his kite and he tied it to the rigging posts that we see here just to keep it out of the water. And he spent the overnight, I think he spent around 12 or 13 hours drifting further and further north until right about here, the wind picked up again and he was able to correct himself. And he actually, if you look, he followed the same start and finish that Louis Blario did from LA to Dover uh, in 1909. Uh, it, it took Cody a, a little bit longer than, than Blario's 26 minutes stuff he was up there overnight. Um, it, was, it was quite an ordeal for him. So 1904, Colonel John Edward Capper of the Army catches on with the Navy, is interested in Cody's developments. And Capper, for some reason, and it's unclear why exactly, took Cody under his wing and made this American civilian uh, the right hand man of the, the War Department. Um, he, Cody, uh, Capper was in charge of the, the balloon uh, office. And he decided that Cody was going to be in charge of development of an airship in Britain. Uh, remember, this is 1904. The Wright brothers have only flown a few months before. Uh, heavier than air flight is virtually unknown still in Europe. Uh, so Capper starts looking closely at Cody's man lifting kites uh, and actually purchases a set, not as man lifters, but as a signaling kite and sent Cody as, as the, the chief instructor of the balloon section uh, at a wage of 50 pounds per month. Uh, 1905, the Klondike Nugget is over. They're done performing at the Alexander Palace, and they moved into Sydenham near the Crystal Palace. Uh, Cody's employment with the Army started as a three-month stint, uh, and it was renewed time after time, Capper taking uh, a shine to Cody, and in August, Cody was named, uh, he was given absolute authority in all matters relating to Cody. Uh, it also stated, again, remember, Cody, not only an American, but a civilian, uh, Capper declared that no officer will issue an order while kiting that's in conflict to Cody. He was given absolute reign over this. And his developments got bigger and bigger. In the center here, we can just make out a pilot in this glider in 1905. This is, I believe, one of the signs. Uh, but to give you an idea about the scope of what Cody is dealing with, it's a 51-foot wingspan, a wing area of 807 square feet, or 75 square meters. To put that into perspective, how many of you have been to the transportation, the Allison transportation, and didn't see the airplanes fly? Now, our Newport 28, which is a moderately sized airplane, is called a 28 because its wing area is 28 square meters. This is 75 square meters. So this is roughly three times the wing area uh, of one of the biplanes that was being used during the First World War. And despite the size of this glider, it weighed only about 116 pounds, uh, 88 pounds less than its creator and pilot. So he was somewhere in the neighborhood of the 200 pound mark. Uh, he managed flights of up to 250 feet in distance, but it was the Sun Vivian who managed the longest flight at over 700 feet until, as, as is, uh, is, is always the case, uh, something's going to happen and, and there's going to be a crash. Vivian fell from 50 feet. Fortunately, he was he survived the crash, but the glider was completely destroyed. Uh, and we can see the wreckage up here. 1906. Capper's aviation program consisted of three fronts. We have balloons, man carrying kites, and we're finally starting to talk about airplanes. Uh, at this point in history, England has no operational heavier than air power craft. Uh, so the airplane is a developmental stage. Um, and Cody starts playing around with a powered kite. Uh, he had a, 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 it was a three cylinder Boucher engine, somewhere around 12 horsepower. Uh, the kite itself was unmanned, and it was sort of an intermediary step between the man gliding and the powered flight. They actually tethered it on a line that was about 100 feet long between two trees, and on the first few flights, they flew on this tethered line, and then they just turned it loose uh, and let it free fly. Um, 
It flew for over four minutes in its first free flight. Uh, of course, landing an unmanned flight is, is going to be disastrous. But this initial design that we see here is really going to become evident when we start to look at some of Cody's full-fledged aircraft. But before we got to, to the heavier than airplanes, Cody has a, a slight diversion of the newly secundus, which is Latin for second to none. Uh, the design of these little wings, it almost looks like an ornithopter. It looks like those wings are midship should flap. But we're powered by an eight-cylinder uh, Antoinette engine. Uh, Antoinette would go on to build some of the most famous early heavier than aircraft. Uh, but this, we can see in the Vendola at the bottom here, we have two or three operators. This is actually, I believe, Colonel Capper himself who steered the airplane. Cody would ride it as well as the engine operator. Um, here we see Cody at the flywheel. It was driven by two propellers. We can see uh, one on each side of the gondola. The fuel tank is up at the top here. And the reason Cody operated the engine is everyone claimed that he was the only one big and strong enough to crank that flywheel open. This was a, a very powerful engine for its time. Um, and Cody had to put all he had behind it to get this thing to run. By 1907, word was out that the German Count Zeppelin uh, was developing his airplanes and was near completion. France had its own dirigible, and on September 9th, uh, Cody and Capper emerged from the airship hangar, uh, with, as I said, Capper at the controls and Cody manning the engine, and they flew 800 feet, circling around the farm rural fields, uh, around the common, covering three miles in 20 minutes. It ended a little bit early when one of the leather belts driving one of the propellers snapped. Uh, but they took it in, and back in, in, in October, the two took it out again and actually managed to fly around London and circle St. Paul's Cathedral, traveling nearly 50 miles on a trip that lasted over three hours. Uh, this is 1907. So, Cody, somebody that none of you have heard of, how many have heard of Count Zeppelin? It's a name that, that managed to live on. Um, so he's, he's racking up these accomplishments that are really on par with some of the world's greatest aviators and developers of the time. Uh, and, and how he sank in the, the chronicles of history, I really don't know. But uh, it's, it's, to me, it's fun to rediscover someone like this. Uh, the trip was, was set down. Uh, in a field, they didn't return to the hangar. I believe weather came in. Yeah, a three-day storm came in and uh, destroyed the balloon. It was never repaired because the, the envelope was too badly damaged. They did introduce a movie Secundus II um, that had a very short life. But uh, airships were just one more step along the way um, in Cody's career in aviation. Now, as much as Colonel Kappa was in Cody's corner, uh, seems to have taken him under his wing. He had to put all of his eggs in Cody's basket. Capital uh, was still working with some fellow Englishmen. Uh, John William Dunn was one of them, and this crazy delta wing contraption is one of Dunn's earliest gliders. Uh, Dunn would go on to work with Burgess, who worked with the Wright brothers uh, in developing heavier than air craft. So, Dunn was, was a wealthy young man. Uh, he had supporters who were among them was found at H.G. Wells, uh, in, in addition to Capper. And in 1906, Dunn was placed with the balloon factory and given free reign to design and test his free flight gliders while Cody was off playing around with balloons. I think Capper had played a little bit of a shell game with Cody and Dunn and had moved Cody over into the balloon department in order to bring someone else who may be able to make development more quickly. Um, fortunately for Cody's sake, Dunn's contrivances were not successful. The other rival for Cody was Elliot Burden Rowe, A.V. Rowe, and if you're an aviation historian, you may recognize that short up being a little bit more to Africa, which was one of the new aircraft manufacturers in England in the early 20th century. Um, this is the flying model 
that road had built in 1907 in order to compete in Lord Northcliffe's Daily Mail Prize for a flying model that could achieve more than, uh, a flight of more than 50 feet. Again, the road started with models and intended to scale up. Uh, but again, Cody would be the first to the punch. And in 1907, his first heavier than aircraft was developed. It was codenamed British Army Airplane Number no. 1, which I think sort of says it all is, is who Cody was when, when they're developing any governments, any countries, number one with military airplane. Uh, there's, there's definitely some credence to what you're doing. This thing was gigantic. It was governed by Cody's personal motto that work will, work will do it. Um, I, I've always contested that, that Cody didn't so much engineer his way into the air as just he absolutely be in submission. Uh, and it's, it's always interesting, I've given this talk before, but when you see things enlarged on the screen, bigger than the little monitor that I put the show together on, uh, I noticed for the first time tonight, if, can anyone see what's all over the room here? What is it? It's mud. These early coilover shocks, these are gigantic springs on the, the landing here. Uh, this is a testament, and we're going to see a bit of this in a few moments, uh, to the terrain, the environments that these airplanes were expected to, to uh, operate in. This is an illustration of the Farnborough Common. In the, the upper corner is the actual Farnborough Common. Uh, I love some of the landmarks here. We have Laffin's Plain, we have Ranger <coughs> Hill, we have Jersey Brow, which I'm pretty sure it will be evident in a moment that it's, it's a reference to, to the Jersey cows that probably graze on these fields. Um, this is where early pilots and pioneers were expected to take off the land with these airplanes. Uh, they were in the mud, they were in the dirt, they were in a field. If you've ever heard the airport referred to as an airfield, it's because that's exactly what they were 100 years ago. They were fields. Uh, when we fly at the Transportation Museum, we have the good fortune to be located on the airport, but our airplanes never touch pavement. They have wooden tail skids, they land and take off in the grass and all this type of field because that's the way they're designed to fly. Um, and, and this is a great illustration of just what these guys had to put up with and what they had to overcome uh, in order to pursue their passions. While he was at Farnborough, he enlisted a team of, they were referred to as wives. They must have been wives of military men who operated at Farnborough. Uh, these airplanes, where do they come from? Uh, yeah, come off. These women are sitting in there at their workstations, hand stitching the fabric on the, the wooden understructure of the ribs. And it was around this time, and I've, I've never found out who this is attributed to, but um, the cotton fabric that they used to cover the wings was rather porous. Um, they, they had uh, Irish linen was typically used to cover these wings, and it was a nice tight weave. But when you're flying through the air, the porosity affects the lift of the wings. And some genius spilled their lunch, I think, and they discovered that tapioca would smear on the wings, <laughs> would seal up those holes, and it would act as a primitive dough uh, or sealing paint uh, that we use on the wings today uh, to provide that integrity that fabric in and of itself is going to be lacking. So, again, who spilled their lunch, I'm not sure. But the airplane that made its way into the air had a 52 foot wingspan. It was 32 feet from front to back. Um, the Wright brothers' first flight, by the way, was 110 feet. So just over double the length of Cody's first airplane. <coughs> this flew at approximately 40 miles an hour. Um, the Wright brothers flew about six or seven miles an hour on their first flight. With his airplane complete, Cody conducted a series of test tops, culminating with his first flight on October 16, 1908. He achieved a height of 30 or 40 feet and a speed of 25 to 30 miles an hour for a distance of nearly 1,400 feet, uh, over a quarter of a mile in 27 seconds. The first flight ended rather abruptly. <laughs> when the left wing struck the ground, it collapsed, the flywheel was broken, and the wheels of the landing gear had buckled. But Cody had done it. He had 
flown the British military airplane number one uh, in its first powered controlled heavy than airplane. The plane was repaired and tested repeatedly, although there was no real great success. Um, the early wind tunnel, if you will, we just using the air around them. These are just streamers <coughs> tied to the wings above and below. Cody in 1909 was actually experimenting with um, very, uh, very practically experimenting with how the air is flowing over and under his wings. I would like to note all of the wheels that we see here. Uh, his main landing gear is just here. One, two, three. We have wheels on the wing tips, wheels as outriggers, training wheels, if you will, uh, for poor landings. He learned a thing or two from his bad landing. Yes. Did he reach flat wings at this point before he arrived? They were a camera. There, there was a camera to them. In, in fact, his early planes, much like the Wright brothers, were only covered on the top of the surface. Um, and as he starts experimenting, not only seeing how the air flows over the wing, but also under the wing, he starts covering both sides. So he's, he's developing this uh, in, a, in a very practical manner, um, much like all of the early engineers. So these pictures, uh, and this is where I really, this one here is where I really started to, to gain an appreciation for the, the, this prolific experimenting. This is from the cover of Flight Magazine, which um, was, I think it's still in publication. It started in the early 1900s. We have from 1909 into the 1960s at the museum. And he appeared on the cover of I don't know how many issues of this weekly trade publication. This was the first one that I came across. It was in 1909. Um, when you consult the index of Flight Magazine, Cody is, I'm pretty sure, even more prominently featured than Louis Blario, Glenn Curtis, even the Wright brothers. English publication, I will grant them that. But uh, this was this was absolutely a, a huge endeavor. He was uh, a force to be reckoned with in early aviation. Let's see. Cody will go on to set distance records uh, from May to July in 1909, uh, completing a four mile flight in July, and then in August he put a second seat in his airplane and completed two firsts in one day. The first was a two-passenger flight. Carl Kaplan himself went up with Cody. The next flight was his wife, Leela, who became the first British woman to fly in an airplane uh, in, in Britain. In September, he achieved a cross-country record of 40 miles in a one-hour flight. And by October, uh, in the, also in October, he participated in the first aviation meet in England uh, at Doncaster. It was there that his airplane earned its, its famous nickname, the Flying Cathedral. The true source of that name is a little bit unclear. They're not sure if it's a reference to the sheer size of the airplane or the size of the hangar that it lived in. But a sort of logical and technical answer for this is in French, when we see a wing that is formed sort of like an upside down V, as we can see most prominently in this wing, when we see it throughout the structure, it's called catechism with a K. Um, and there's a lot of speculation that the flying cathedral got its name from the shape of the airplane. Another of my favorite images is Cody reverting to his cowboy ways when one of his airplanes nosed over. Uh, he didn't want to damage it any further. And I, I won't go on record, but I, I will say that I'm pretty sure I've seen this done with airplanes around Knott's County. <laughs> they lasso the tail wheel and pull the airplane up right now. If you've been to our museum, and we don't leave a comment on this before the show started, how nice and cool the floor is. We don't have those big, massive features in the under the vehicles like we do in Owl's Head. If you ever wonder why these old vehicles need drip pans, is look at the underside of the wing here. That's just oil that's blown all over the fabric. From the engine, these, these things are nasty, messy vehicles. Right? Uh, go and things as, as and so, this is the Now, many of the uh, many of the cash prizes that were awarded, I mentioned uh, the Lord North Coast ten thousand pound prize, uh, and the Daily Mail was one of the largest uh, benefactors to the aviation cause in England. 
Uh, but in order to participate in most of these contests, uh, you had to be a British subject. So it was in late 1909, Cody actually became uh, a British citizen, a British subject, uh, in order to compete and, uh, in these events. And at the Doncaster meet, uh, he, he hit the event that he set a number of records. Uh, he kind of thumbed his nose at his, his new home country because after they played they played God Save the King. Cody did instructed the band to strike out the Star Spangled Banner. I'm not sure how well that went over. <laughs> despite forfeiting his American citizenship and becoming a, a British subject, uh, he, he still maintained his patriotism. Uh, and within an hour of the beginning of the meet, he uh, expressed his intention to buy for the Daily Mail's prize for a thousand pounds, which wasn't much at the time, but for a closed one mile circuit. Um, a lot of these flights that were being conducted, when they did complete a loop, it was done over a very long distance. Um, they, these planes were not terribly maneuverable, and to fly a circle in a mile's distance was, was a great feat. Um, and for that thousand pound prize, that's what Cody became the British subject for. But it opened up many other doors for him. Um, in fact, in, in 1910, in need of money, as he typically was, he started advertising his aircraft for sale. Uh, and this is one of the advertisements uh, that, that was published in 1910. Uh, the year did, however, end on a more positive note with Cody winning the Michelin Cup for the longest cross country flight. He flew 185 miles in four hours and 47 minutes, um, winning the 500 pound prize. Uh, but he also set the all British record for duration and distance. 1911, I mentioned those two early biographies. The guy on the way was one of the biographers. That's George Broomfield, close personal friend of Cody. Uh, I can only assume they're testing wing loading in midair. Uh, but again, it gives you an idea of just how enormous this thing was. Uh, and, and also how stable it was by being able to put a full grown person outboard like this. It's really a testament to the, the stability of the airplane and the pilot's ability as well. October of 1911, uh, there were a series of Michelin Cups, and the longest distance flight uh, was one of the competitions. Other were around a prepared circuit. Two characteristics were common among them. They all carried a large cash prize and trophy. Uh, again, as I mentioned, they were open only to British citizens. Uh, and this is where Cody's fortune really seemed to start turning around in 1911. Uh, in August, the Army announced that a military trials for aircraft would be held, with the winning participant's airplane to be purchased by the, the British government. It was a 4,000 pound prize and an additional 1,000 pounds to the all British entry. Um, there were about, uh, let's see here, I think there were 19 competitors uh, nine of which were British, with Cody among them. Um, he failed to take the top prize that year, but the next year really would be his, his come up with. He added three more seats to his airplane. And typically with aircraft, we, we want to make them as light as we possibly can. We want to use the least and lightest materials. The seats that he used were iron tractor seats. <laughs> Like I said, he didn't engineer his way into the air. He just he used the biggest hammer he could. And he beat the air into submission. And he became the first person to take five people in the air in 1912. Uh, four passengers flying seven miles. Uh, a series of crashes could have hampered his enthusiasm. Uh, his his uh, Circuit of Britain plane, one of the biggest prizes that he was buying for, was wrecked by a student. And in July, Cody introduced a monoplane, 46 and a half foot wingspan, so big that Cody could hang from one of the wingtips with his arms over his head and his toes wouldn't touch the ground. Um, and it's here that I speculate about Jersey Hill uh, flying around Farnborough so with this monoplane. Let me just see, no, I didn't, I didn't show the crash of this, fortunately. It was flying this monoplane that he struck one of the paths uh, coming in from a landing, destroying the airplane, uh, 
killing Kyle, unfortunately. Cody seems to be virtually invulnerable in all of these crashes. Uh, one of my favorite crash stories was in his kiting days where in, in a downdraft, the kite plummeted, fell into a tree, Cody grabbed the tree, fell out, he was ejected from the kite basket, grabbed the hold of the tree and climbed his way down. Um, he overcame tremendous obstacles in, in his endeavors. But as I said, all of his airplanes were ruined. He had to scramble to rebuild one of his biplane designs um, in order to compete for the military trials. And here's Cody standing alongside, giving a, a sense of the scope of this. The military trials consisted of, and I, I jumped ahead a bit, it was 32 airplanes that competed for the, the British military trials. 31 of them arrived crated, probably by rail or horse drawn. One of them was flown there for lack of time. Guess who that was? <laughs> Sam Cody flew his airplane in the competition. He was competing against aircraft such as Farman, Lario, Padrio, and Zephyr which are among the, the leaders in the field uh, in the turn of the 20th century. These are the criteria for the military uh, trials. They were, they were vying for the time taken to climb to 1,000 feet, three hours flight with a full load, how fast could it fly, but also how slowly could it fly. Gliding angle, so how far can it glide, distance run after landing, how, how quickly can it stop, how short of a landing can it make. Uh, flying in a high wind, showing maximum and minimum strength of the wind, time taken to dismantle a machine for road transport. It take it apart, put it back together, and get it into the air time taken to assemble the machine on arrival, and my favorite was alighting on a plowed field. They took a harrow out, and they plowed the field, but you didn't land with the field, you landed corduroy, which lost the plow with the field. Um, Cody's airplane did win a few of the individual competitions. Uh, it wasn't an outstanding performer in any particular field. What it was, was tremendously consistent. Uh, consistent enough to win all the prize money, the 4,000-pound prize for the overall winner, and 1,000 pounds for the all-British airplane. Um, finally, Cody had been recognized by the military. This is 1912. He'd been struggling with them since around 1900 when his first invention, the firearm, uh, and made and lost fortunes over and over again uh, before he really got this recognition that he so richly deserved. He wasn't happy to just call it quits. Uh, he had succeeded, but he was still making developments. This is actually a flying ambulance. And this rectangle that we see here is a specially developed, it was actually approved by the military. Uh, it was a patented, portable, fully equipped operating table. And you can carry a surgeon, a medic, an assistant, and an anesthesiologist <coughs> with a portable surgery table all on board. Um, the plane gave the approval of both the British Medical Association and the British Medical Journal. Um, kind of a quirky but amazing feat. Another development was Cody's hydroplane of 1913. Again, the Daily Mail <coughs> offered a second circuit of Britain race with a float plane contest. Uh, this was Cody's largest plane yet, a 60-foot wingspan, but he wasn't satisfied with that. He planned on uh, scaling this up even further to a 100-foot wingspan to be powered by a 400-horse engine. In 1913, oh yeah, I'm not sure where he counted on finding the 400-horse powered engines, but he did, and he had hoped to win a 10,000-pound prize, again, sponsored by the Daily Mail, crossing the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. On August 7th, Cody conducted his first passenger carrying flight with the hydroplane and was pleased with his performance, uh, even stating his optimism in the circuit of Britain race. The second passenger flight of the day, however, proves to be fatal for Cody. His, his, uh, his luck had run out. Uh, there was speculation over what was the cause of the crash. Uh, one of the sons said that he saw the propeller burst in midair. One bystander said that the passenger was clinging to Cody with both arms, looked like he was panicked and, and grabbing hold of him. Others said no because the passenger is seated behind and above the pilot. 
it was just an illusion. There was even a speculation that Cody's light bulb version of the color green had finally done him in. <laughs> Rumor said that Cody would never wear anything green when he flew, he would never allow his passengers to wear anything green. Rumor, speculation only, claims that when the passenger was uh, examined, what was the show wearing? Green socks. Uh, no truth to the <laughs> But an interesting sidebar story to, to Cody's life. Um, both, unfortunately, were, were killed instantly. This is an image of Cody's funeral procession. He was buried in the military ce cemetery at Aldershot. Keep in mind, was not ever enrolled or enlisted in the military. He was the first civilian to be honored uh, by burial in the military cemetery. Uh, 50,000 people attended his funeral, and papers carried front page stories uh, across Europe. Thomas Sopwith, uh, inventor and builder of the Sopwith Pup, the camel, and the snipe of World War I fame, claimed that Cody's death was the biggest blow aviation has yet suffered. Sam Cody was one of the most decorated and dedicated flyers in the world. It should be known as such, but his name is, is barely known. Uh, I was introduced to Cody through his work with kites, and fortunately today, Cody's kites are still being flown, albeit they're being built with modern materials. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of nylon and a lot of carbon fiber involved in these. This is, uh, I was trying to recall, I, I, I think it's in the uh, Scandinavian really have a passion for Cody. And there are festivals that fly his, coat, uh, his kites uh, still today. And they even find a few adventurous folks to go up in a basket on the, the kite train, just like Cody himself did nearly 100 years ago. So, in a nutshell, uh, yeah, there's Samuel Cody, uh, fascinating character. I can't encourage you enough. There are books still being published about him. Uh, just come across another that's, that's been issued. There are three or four. And if you really find an interest in this, I encourage you to check out the Drachen Foundation in Washington State. It's German, Drachen, D-R-A-C-H-E-N. It's German for kite, uh, German for dragon, which is what they call the kites. And they were the purchasers. I referenced that some of these auctions in 96 where this enormous collection of Cody memorabilia went up for auction. The vast majority of the kite and aviation related memorabilia went to this drop in power. Uh, stories of, of the auction where the, the, the car went up, it didn't come down until it was really done. And eventually the audience realized that there was no contending uh, in this organization that desperately wanted this Cody memorabilia. So there's, despite the lack of Recognition. There's an abundance of information still available for them in our active societies all over the world who celebrate uh, the endeavors of Sam Cody. Yes, Stephen, did they ever use material similar to parachute material? The reason I ask the question is, at the end of World War II, I had to live quite many years of class. It seems as if somebody had dumped a lot of old parachutes there, which being scrounged, and obtained some of them. And I built box kites. Mm -hmm. They had an unbelievable amount of lift. Yep. Uh, the, the Chinese were, were big at it. It's, it's parachutes made of silk. Um, and, and, uh, the Chinese had a long history of using silk for kites. I've never seen any evidence of silk being used with airplanes. I'm really not sure if it's too, it, it can't be too fragile because we can trust our lives in the form of a parachute. But right. cotton was right, geez, I have to look into when seconite replaced cotton. And seconite is a, uh, a polyester. So we transitioned from cotton to seconite. I've never seen it. Probably cheaper than silk. Probably is. Uh, but an interesting story, the reason uh, the, well, I should say, the early aviators who had been forced to bail out of airplanes were members of a, a very special club known as the Caterpillar Club. Uh, it's because the parachutes were made out of silk, uh, which came from caterpillars. 
So rather than saying I crashed the plane and had to bail out, they made a name up that it sounded rather dignified and mysterious. But no, I've never seen airplanes, uh, at least not any real production, of them. So, yes? What's uh, one of the photographs that captioned this Colonel Cody? I, yeah, I, I've never really known where Colonel Cody came from. He wasn't a Kentucky Colonel, as far as I know. Uh, but I think it was more of an affectation, because yeah. he was always out on the field with the military, because other than the theater, almost all of his work in England was done with the military, and he was given absolute brain over everything that went on. So I really have never seen a real Attribution for why he would refer to as Cody. In fact, one of the title the title of one of the books is called Cody Flying Machine. He said when, when he was flying that dirigible shaped balloon, was that a hot air balloon? Was that a it was most balloon? likely hydrogen filled. Yeah. Uh, hydrogen was the dominant source of dominant gas. And and that was uh, definitely a dirigible type rather than a Zeppelin. No, Castro Oil was Yeah, Castro Oil was used in aviation engines, but it was predominantly used in rotor engines, where the whole engine spins, like the, the Southland airplanes and the, the German ER1 triplane, uh, the Red Baron is so well known for. Um, and that was I maybe mean, going a little bit far afield, but that's because the way the, the fuel and the oil were introduced in the engine was simultaneous mix them, um, and petroleum oil would follow the plugs and mix the mixture so the fuel would burn. Castor oil is vegetable based, so it doesn't, it mixes with the fuel, but it doesn't combine chemically. Uh, so it's able to pass through the engine, lubricate everything, and then pass it right back out of the engine without really doing damage um, to the ignition system. So that was almost like the petroleum oil. It was a flow through the system. Yeah, total loss of lubrication. It's like, most everything in this room here. Um, it really closed crank bases at that time. Yes? Um, I'm curious why um, he had to go to England for all this. Um, there weren't there any this kind of flying here? Well, he went to England for the stage performances. And Buffalo Bill at this time had, he had gained his reputation uh, as, as Buffalo Bill in the United States, but he actually took a show in England because for some reason, um, the culture in England just could not get it up in the cowboy persona. Uh, because of the fascination. It wasn't the, it was, it was, he went where the audience was, and I suspect that Sam Cody was following up with Bill Cody's lead by going where the audience was um, for that particular event. Over there. Yeah, all of his work was conducted in England. But it was it was happenstance. He ended up in England for, for the stage performances first, and then started playing for the flying machines. And just stayed where he was. Thank you all very much, everybody. <laughs>